today, with God's help, I'm going to preach a message out of Acts chapter 3. You can turn there in your Bible. And uh, before we read it, though, I want to give you a bit of context. Acts chapter 1 and 2, if you want to go back in uh, our sermon archive on YouTube or on the podcast. By the way, we have the audio podcast available and you can always go on iTunes or Spotify and listen to the sermons. But on Pentecost Sunday, I preached the message out of Acts chapter 1 and 2, so I'm not going to spend time there today. But some context before Acts chapter 3, the believers are waiting in the upper room for the promise of the Father. And the promise of the Father Jesus told them about, it was a, it was a promise of the Holy Spirit, that they would receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And it's a baptism of fire and of power. And in fact, Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, And you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. So this is a bit of the context. And right after that, there are, you know, it says there's a sound like a mighty rushing wind. What appeared like tongues of fire rested on the 120 of them that were all believers, all in the upper room. And then they began to speak in tongues, in languages that they never learned before. And the people who were gathered in Jerusalem were attracted to this sound that they were hearing. And they all start to lean in a little more to see what is actually happening on this day. And when all this happens, you know, people said, oh, they're just drunk, don't worry. And Peter steps up. And Peter begins to preach his first sermon. And what we find is 3,000 people are added to the church that day. So on the day the church was born, it, it blimped up to 3,000 plus. You see that? So that's the context. And now we're going to get to Acts chapter 3. And it's interesting. 3,000 people are saved. But how many of you know the one person, the one is still important? 3,000 are added, but God still cares about the one. And so God is a God of numbers. There's a whole book in our Bible called Numbers. God says, count your blessings. Name them one by one. That's a hymn that we used to sing. Anyone know it? Yeah. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. So we're supposed to take inventory. We're supposed, like 3,000 were added. It's a specific recorded number. And as much as that is all true, God still cares about the one. Jesus, in fact, told the story about the shepherd. And if he's got 99 sheep that he knows they're found and they're all here, but he lost one, will he not go and find the one and bring it back? Yes, he will. And he was saying it's the same in the kingdom. Now, chapter 3 of Acts, we're going to, you have your Bible, hopefully I'm going to open mine so I'm there with you. And I want to read to you out of this story. Would you stand if you're able? Acts chapter 3, we stand in awe and in reverence of God's word, knowing that God's word is alive and active, Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, and it has the ability it's like a double-edged sword that it can cut straight through bone and marrow to the really center of who you are, exposing you for who you really are. Not to everyone around you, but to let you know this is what you're made of. And it could be of substance or not. God's Word has that kind of living power. So we stand in awe and in reverence of his word. Acts 3 verse 1, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the 3 o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. And Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, Look at us. 
The lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankle, ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. Then, walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. All the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. And when they realized he was the lame beggar they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. They all rushed out in amazement to Solomon's colonnade where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is already anointed. It's going to accomplish everything you need it to because your word works. And Lord, I pray now for myself. I ask for your anointing upon me, my mind, my lips, my heart, that I might speak your word to your people the way you intended to be delivered. God, I thank you for the privilege we have. And Lord, may we leave different than how we walked in. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated this morning. We just finished Acts chapter 2, a story about the 3,000 that are added to the church. Acts chapter 3, in stark contrast, goes to a story about one. I want you to see it. I paint it very clearly. God cares about you. God cares about you as an individual. You might be in a room of people, but God still has the ability to single you out. And if he does, it's not to embarrass you, because sometimes I'll have a word that I feel like I have to give. Other times, it just might be what God's doing on the inside of you, and it shows up as tears, or, oh God, why do I feel like I'm about to burst in tears? It's not to embarrass you. It's because he's dealing with you. And if God deals with you, it's because he cares about you, and he doesn't want to leave you the same. And so... That's the kind of God we serve. So 3,000 added to the church. Here is one. And his disciples, I'm just thinking, you know, in a very humanistic way. If you preach your first sermon and 3,000 are added, and you have a habit of going to pray at the temple, because it was an hour of prayer. In fact, there were three. And in the third hour, the sixth hour, and the ninth hour of the day, 6 a.m., 12 p.m., and, and 3 p.m., there was this habit of going there. I preached my first sermon, 3,000 people. My human nature says, I've walked this road before. I've seen this guy a million times before, always shaking his can, asking for money. I'm just going to continue on because I'm here to pray. I'm not here to give any money. You see that? 3,000. Well, where's my next opportunity to preach to the crowd? Because we want the crowd. Once you've tasted 3,000, maybe you're like, God, is it going to be 4,000? And God still cares about what? The one. And the title of the message today is simply this, Real Help. Real Help. Because there were people who were there helping this man every day. And it said that they carried him to the gate called Beautiful. And they would place him there on his mat. And the scripture tells us they did this so that he could what? Beg. So the intent was known. We're going to bring this guy. We're going to help this guy. Because he can't get there himself, he's lame. And we're going to place him at the gate called Beautiful. And hopefully people are going to feel generous and they're going to give some alms. And they're going to bless him. And he could go on his day. And tomorrow we're going to do this all over again. When I think of Peter and John walking to the temple on this day, it should have been an ordinary day. In fact, it was. This is something they were in a habit of doing. Let's go to pray. This same man who's lame was in a habit of doing the same thing. Yes, you see it? It's an ordinary day. Nothing is different. But 
I want to draw your attention to verse 2. It says, as they approach the temple, a man, and it's very specific, lame from birth. Lame from birth. So it's not that he was born and there was an injury or an accident that caused this disability that he had. But since birth, he had this condition. But we read the text and you know the end of the story. He's, he is forever changed. And the Bible tells us walking and leaping and praising God, he then goes into the temple. So it's an ordinary day, but an ordinary day for God is an extraordinary opportunity. For God to do something in his life, but today for you might be an ordinary day, but it's an extraordinary day for God to do something in your life. And I want to build your faith. You heard the testimonies. We've spent time praying. But as you hear the word today, let it come alive. And the word works. The word works. So as they approach, he's lame from birth. And he's being carried in, we said. Again, ordinary day for Peter and John. Ordinary day for the lame man. Right? And I have to stop long enough to also say, but he had help. He was lame, but he had help. They, they would bring him there. So my question I submit to you is, but was it real help? If he stayed the same and nothing changed and it was ordinary now for his whole entire life, was it real help? If you're a believer, you should answer this. No. It was some help, but not real help because it didn't really change his circumstances. He was put there to beg from the people who were coming. It was predictable. Everything was calculated. The positioning of the man by the gate. It was meant to pull on their heartstrings knowing they're coming with some money. They're going to they're be able to give some. It was intentional. But it wasn't real help. I want to submit to you that God can do something new. God can do something brand new. And what I mean by that is something that never existed before in your life, never existed before in your family, or something that never existed before even in your own body. God can do something brand new. And that's why I draw emphasis to he was lame since birth. Because we would just conclude, well, this is his lot in life. But was it? No, he just got some help. But Peter and John were getting ready to give him real help that would make the difference. God can do something brand new. So he sees Peter and John. This is verse 3. And when he sees them, look at what it says in verse 3. Peter and John, verse 4, sorry. He sees them and he's thinking, oh, they can give me money. Because I'm sure he looks at people, and by the way, Peter and John were approaching. Maybe he got excited. His expectation was raising, not for healing, for money. Because that's why he was there. But look at verse 4. It says, Peter and John looked at him intently. So if I was the lame man, it's almost like, oh, okay, sweet. I got, I got two guys. They're going to give me something. And he sees them, and he asks them for some money. Now, I have a question for you to think about. Is it wrong to give to the poor, to the beggars? Maybe when I exit uh, Weston Road off the 401 and I'm at the light and I see like Tim Hortons and McDonald's in front of me, there's always someone here. There's always someone begging and I see them every single day. Truthfully, I just don't carry cash. But yesterday we were at, was it Costco? A Fortino's in the parking lot. And my wife has changed somehow. And, but we, we want to teach our kids. And there was a man and he just asked for some change, I guess. I wasn't paying attention fully. But my wife went over and gave him whatever she had and gave. And, and this is what I tell my kids. And it's actually a scripture, Proverbs 19, verse 17. You can write this down. It says, if you help the poor, you're actually lending to God and he will repay you. If you give to the poor, it's like you're lending to God 
and he will repay you. Not the poor man, he will repay you. Now, again, my mind thinks, well, is he just going to go buy booze or cigarettes? Is he just going to, and some of them, if you're a bad beggar, I will not give. Just putting it out there. I see the guy with like cigarettes. I'm like, if you can't present yourself as, you know, in a, don't smoke the cigarette in front of me. Put it away and do a good job of asking. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm saying, if, you're, if you want people to give, just a, a rule of life, make it so that they will want to give. But when I see that, I'm like, no, I, that's a bad beggar. My kids are good beggars. <laughs> they, they ask until we say yes. And they know if I look cute and Nathan puts his little pouty lip, Priscilla just melts like wax. And she's like, fine, just take it. And I'm, I'm like the tough guy. I'm, they don't ask me anymore. They know. But here's this guy, and he's thinking, I got my two. By the way, so is it, is it wrong to give to the poor? If you ask me as your pastor, I'll say no. Do it as often as you have change or bills in your pockets. Um, some of you now, you're like, I'm not going to. I'll switch to the, the digital giving <laughs> so I don't have cash or change. When there's an opportunity, like Emmanuel said, to do good, let's do good. And if they use it to buy cigarettes or drugs or booze, that's not on me. That's on them. And what they do with it, that's on them. But I'll leave it at that. I want to move on in the sermon. Yeah, I'll tell you one more story. Right here at Weston, it was during the week, a number of years ago, and um, there was a man knocking on the front door, and I opened the door, and I had seen, I, I, I have a good memory. Sometimes I'll forget some names, but if I've met a face, chances are I'll remember. This man walked in, is because he didn't have many teeth in his mouth. And that was like, for me, the trigger in my memory of, oh, I remember this guy. The first time I met him, he said to me, oh, Italian church. And he said, I know pastor so-and-so. And I was like, no, nah, that wasn't a pastor on staff here ever. Uh, but he goes, yeah, Italian people. I said, yeah, we have some Italian people. And I was chatting with him, and he shared a need. He said, I have my family that's coming over into the country, and we need bus tokens so we could get to uh, this place. We have work lined up on Monday, but he said, I don't have money to get us to work. We need the money, and then we could pay you back. We'll come on Sunday. And so I, I looked at him. I said, so you need bus tokens. And I said, hey, I won't give you money, but let's go. We'll take a drive down the street. There's a plaza there with a convenience store, and we could buy bus tokens there. And so I pull up, and I walk in with him. I had my debit card. I said, how much do you need? He, he, he told me how many tokens. I did the math, and I'm like, well, that's almost $80 worth of tokens. <laughs> Whether the story checked out with how many people and how many bus trips, I didn't care at that point. I just said, what do you need? How many tokens? And I said, I'm just going to buy it for you. And I wasn't alone. I, I had a friend, Dave Spataro. Some of you know him. He was visiting and with me at the church. And so he was in the car with me. We did the drive. Bought the tokens. He said, I didn't say, so Sunday you'll be here and, and you're going to repay me, right? Because you worked and all. Um, he, he said, Sunday, I come with my family and we'll make sure to pay. I said, all right, no worries. I never saw the guy again. <laughs> but in my heart, I said, I don't care. If he lied to me and I'm offended, that's, that's my problem. But I gave to him, not because he said, I'm going to pay you back. But the word says, when you give to the poor, it's like you're lending to God. And he'll repay you. So I don't need to worry about that. And you know what? I've, I've been given Pentecostal handshakes that way more than cover that cost. So I'm not worried about that. But here's the crazy part. About a year or two ago, after a Sunday service, everyone cleared out. 
And my wife's like, someone's at the door. This would have been the third time. And I go, and I think she let him in, and she said, he's sitting on the bench there waiting in the foyer. And I go, and it's the same guy. <laughs> and he's like, oh, hi, Italian pastor. I'm in a church. So I sit over there. Uh, church looks good. Renovation. All this. And, and I just said, I was like, I remember you. And he's like, you know, I need bus tokens. And he started with the same story. And I said, hey, I said, that, that's not going to work today. I, I said, um, if you, and as soon as I like, he knew, no, this guy recognized me, he left. And, uh, and I don't say that to say that I was mean to him. It's just that. I don't think you're being honest. I think you probably go and instead of getting a job, which he's strong, young guy, not young, but he's strong, sorry, able-bodied, walked up to the building, not off a bus, maybe he needs tokens. But I look at that and I say, well, here's a man who has the ability to do way more for himself, but instead tries to take instead of figuring it out for himself. So. I'm going to move on, but I thought that was an interesting story. But give, he who gives to the poor lends to God. I, I want that to stick here. I want that to stick. And God will repay however he wants to. Here's this lame man. He sees Peter and John, and now they're looking at him, and he's like, sweet. I got two more, and they're going to give me something. Verses 4 to 6, though, tell us it was a totally different story that was about to unfold. Because Peter and John show up, and Peter says, I know what you're asking for. He didn't say it that way, but it was implied. I know what you're asking for, but silver and gold, I don't got it. Instead, what I do have, let me give it to you. And the money would have been some help but not real help. You see that? What he didn't have, silver and gold, would have been some help. But he didn't stop there and just say, well, sorry, I don't, can't help you. He said, what I do have, I give to you. And, and that's really where I want to camp today in the time that we have left. It's not about the silver and gold. Peter and John, they look at him intently. Peter says, look at us. So now Peter is actually taking control of the situation. Because God was about to do something miraculous. The lame man since birth, never, it probably never crossed his mind what was just about to happen. You could be sitting in this room today and have no idea what God's about to do in your life. Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for you at the close of this service. But I want your faith to be stirred. And he says, look at us. The lame man looks eagerly, but his expectation's wrong. He's thinking money. They're saying, we don't got it. Instead, we're going to give you something you didn't even know you what needed. And that's just like God. He shows up on your broken road, and he's there to give you something you didn't even know you needed. Those of you who've been in church and you're saved and you have a testimony, you know that's true. You know that God met you at some low point probably where you didn't know you needed a Savior, but He showed up anyway. The Bible says while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That means that God knew ahead of time that we would have this big need of Jesus. And, and God made a way where there was no way. They were about to offer him something he didn't even know he needed or that he could have. Because I'm sure no one had ever told him, hey, you know, you can be healed. Hey, you know that your life can be changed forever and you don't have to beg for money. You can actually get up and go to work and do something with your life. He didn't know he needed it and he didn't know that he could have his healing and I want to submit to the church today, believers today, there's a world outside these four walls of this building that need what you've got. 
They need what you've got. That's why when I went to the Vaughn Food Bank, I'm like, here's a generous man who gives food, gives food, and organizes and oversees all of this stuff. He's a sharp man at 84, but I'm like, I don't know if he has Jesus. So if I could pray for him, I don't know what God wants to do. That, as he was talking, I felt bad, Emmanuel, in one sense, because half the time I was just looking for an opportunity to like figure out, okay, how can I get him to stop talking a little bit, long enough that I can actually get to the prayer part? Because I felt the Spirit stirring in me to pray for him. And what we've got on the inside is the power of the Holy Ghost. And it works for a crowd of 3,000. It works for a crowd of one person yeah. who didn't even know they needed a touch. But when they're asking for help, we have real help. We have real help that makes the difference. Peter's response is what the church should be saying to our friends, to our coworkers, to the people on our sports teams. When we're back in school and it's in session to our classmates and to our teachers, it's simply this. I'll give you what I have. I will give you what I have. And he says to him, now get up and walk. Get up and walk. Now, it's, that's real help. But I want you to know, I've made up my mind that I'm not going to be a part of a church. Now, I'm the lead pastor, so that means I'm not going to pastor a church that's just content to talk about the things of God. That's not enough. It is important to proclaim the word. But it, we're not just going to talk about, oh, healing or, you know, and never live to experience what the Word says we can experience. It's very important. It's, you hear the preaching, but then it's like, okay, God, we're responding to your Word now. That's how we work the Word out. And, and unless we begin to operate at that second part, I hear the word, we proclaim the word, but now we see God demonstrating it and we live it out. It's in us and then through us. I don't know if we could ever touch another person. If all it was was about hearing a good sermon, after the first good sermon, they would have been done. 3,000 were saved. Yes, this must have been it. The power came. We preached the sermon. 3,000 were added. Jesus, come and take us now. But we're not done. We're not done. There's a world outside that needs what we've got. And God is calling his church with the limited time that we have left to say, I'm ready and I'm willing to make a difference. I'm ready to be poured out like a drink offering, the Apostle Paul said. And many of us need to think about our lives that same way. What God fills and pours into me, it has to overflow to touch and reach everyone. Some of us, we get this. Others, you have yet to understand what I'm saying. That's okay. Because when God starts to fill you, it's going to overflow. And you're going to know there's so much. The only problem you'll have is you won't have room to contain what God's doing inside. And that's living in the overflow. And it affects everyone that's around you. That's how Peter and John were walking and living this New Testament life. They're on the way to prayer, but there's a greater need here. And they stop and they said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, silver and gold we don't have, but in, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And the Bible says that he extends his right hand to reach out and to help him up. Yeah. And I want to read to you the order of the events. We read it, but I, I read it quickly. Now that we're here, I want to read this to you. Verse 7, Acts chapter 3. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand. Actually, you know what? Let's start at verse 6. Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. So he gave the what? The word was first. Number one. Verse seven, second part. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. Did the miracle happen yet? No. 
It's on the screen because it continues in the verse. But I want you to understand if you put yourself in Peter's shoes. It's your right hand. You said the word. Now you're stretching your hand. The miracle didn't happen. But you're saying, get up and walk. Again, the word works. God's word. So then I have to make sure I'm saying what God has said. Jesus is our healer. It's still true. Number one. Number two, now I have to work the word. So I extend my hand and I say, and you cannot do this without faith. If there's no faith, there's no right hand <laughs> extending to say, get up and walk. But the miracle happens when Peter steps out in faith. He gives the word, steps out in faith, reaches his hand and says, verse 7, takes him by the hand, helps him up, and as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. A man who never knew he could walk, never even probably thought that he could ever walk, Someone comes and stops long enough. The same one who preached to 3,000. Sorry, who preached and 3,000 got saved. Stops for the one. And he says, get up and walk. Here's my hand. And the miracle happens after the word's given and after faith operates. Because it takes faith to reach your hand to pull the guy and it took a measure of faith for the layman to have a willingness to get up. And as he did, the miracle begins to happen. The immediate results, I want to read them. Right away. So, like I'm not a doctor, and I'm not a scientist, and I'm not a sports doctor or anything like that. Some of you are way more qualified in this area than me. If someone has never walked before... How are their legs? You would, like a, a calf. I have a picture of a calf being born. And they're like floppy. Not able to stand on their own yet. But, but look at the next verse. Right after he pulls him up. The miracle happens. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. Well, that's a miracle all on its own. Then, it doesn't stop there, it gets even more intense. Then walking and leaping and praising God, he went into the temple with them. You know why I love this story? Because every religious person that just walked by this man for years, who are now in the temple and all, we're here for prayer, suddenly recognize, isn't this the guy that was out there this morning or this afternoon, three o'clock prayer time? Isn't this the guy that got some help because they would carry him there? How in the world is, are my eyes like, maybe I need prayer. How is this guy in the temple? You're not supposed to even be in the temple. You're a lame man. And here he is in the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And I want to draw your attention to the response. Verse 9, all the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. When they realized he was the lame beggar they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. They were absolutely astounded. In other words, they couldn't believe their eyes. Is this really happening? They all rush out in amazement to Solomon's colonnade where the man, listen, was holding tightly to Peter and John. I'm just trying to put myself in this man's shoes. Maybe he doesn't know he's frightened. He's, what are people going to think? But he's close to the people that God used, that gave him real help. He didn't run to the guys who carried him for years. He was drawn to the two that said, look at us. We don't have what you're asking for. We have something better. We have the real, we have the answer to the real need that you have. And I want to read beyond where we stopped. One more verse, verse 12. 
I want you to see this. It said that all the crowd, they rushed in amazement to Solomon's colonnade where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. Verse 12, Peter saw his opportunity and then addressed the crowd. You see the flow? After 3,000, if he would have gone looking, where's my next 3,000 people? He wouldn't have found it. He stopped for the one. He ministered to the one. And God brought the crowd again to him. Don't miss that. And when Peter, he was so alert that when he saw the people rushing out to see and they're all looking intently, Peter saw his opportunity and addressed the crowd. When I read this story, I think about the church. How we can come, every Sunday we gather. I'm grateful for your faithful attendance. We have a lot of views. We get about 230 views on YouTube from our service. So almost more people or equal amounts in the room and online. When I think about that. But we can make this just an ordinary thing because we get comfortable, we get used to it. Some of us, maybe we've been coming to this church for years. And it's just like a, a, a tire stuck in a ditch, in a rut. And it just, it's like autopilot. It just flows because this is the flow it's been. And I believe today God just wants to remind you that every day, like Wycliffe said, his mercies are new every morning. The only thing constant is God. But my expectation should always be greater. Say, God, what are you going to do? God, what do you have in store? God, who is the one or the crowd that you're bringing today? I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. Rachel, if you could just come back to the keys real quick. You know, it took boldness for Peter to act in faith, to say, hey, get up and walk. Before seeing it with his eyes, we walk by what? Faith, not by sight. So faith doesn't matter what I see with my eyes open. In fact, maybe some of you, you just need to close your eyes right now. And through the eyes of faith, God wants to show you maybe faces of people that he wants you to minister to. It might be people you know in your family, on your street. But faith is what pleases God at the end of the day. When Wycliffe sold his house, he, he told me, I don't remember if he shared it this morning, he said, I didn't share this with many people because I know the advice would be, don't do it, you're crazy. But faith says you walk by faith, not by sight. And so he did it anyway because he was acting on a word. And it was a word from God and the word from God works. Now you got to work the word. And, and I believe God wants to use you. People all around us, they're asking for help. They're looking for help. Don't be the person that's going to toss the coin in the bucket when you've got the actual answer to the problem. I mean, it's not an excuse to say, well, no, I'm not going to give you money. Meet the need physically, but then allow the Holy Spirit to give you eyes to see beyond that need and to see the needs all around. And as a church, as your pastor, if I could do one thing, it's going to be that we don't look with our eyes anymore, but we look through the eyes of faith, and we care about those around us. Will we always get it right? Probably not. But we got to do our best, and, and we got to listen for His voice. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to take a moment 
and just allow the Holy Spirit to speak. Because His word to you, one word from the Holy Spirit straight to you, far more powerful than a sermon I could try to preach. So just listen. Say, Holy Spirit. Say this with me. Holy Spirit, would you speak to me today? I'm listening. Just take a moment to listen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Some of you aren't used to getting still before the Lord. You're not used to getting quiet and just waiting, just listening. There's a moment just for you to listen, to hear his voice again. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak even now. God, we are your people. And Lord, if we receive a word from you, Give us faith to take you at your word, but give us faith to move on your word as well. 